the challenge, the opportunity to connect. The 1960s, a time of imagination and change, a time of anger and fear. The 1960s, a program called Challenge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of faith. Nearly 60 years later, during these challenging times, we'll take a new look at our divisions, our connections, in a new program called Challenge 2.0. In 1960, faith leaders from three major traditions, Judaism, Catholic, and Protestant Christianity, joined in a groundbreaking effort to build bridges between their communities. It came at a time of rising prejudice and bigotry, together with anger and even violence. Fifty-nine years later, the surviving member of that team, Catholic priest William Tracy, is celebrating his 100th birthday. In this episode of Challenge 2.0, Blessed are the Peacemakers, we examine the work of Father Tracy and his colleagues and how it built a foundation for a sense of hope today. The gentle beauty of Ireland's rolling hills and forests is balanced by its exposure to the storm-swept North Atlantic. It's an environment that has led to a deeply introspective response to the challenges of life. It was here in Kittlesmeestia, southwest of Dublin, that William Tracy was born in 1919. He was raised in this home with two brothers and a sister. His parents impressed upon them the importance of community, of service, of their faith. Fidelity to those values required perseverance. Catholicism was banned in Ireland, you know, until 1829. Ireland was then an occupied nation. British troops patrolled the streets. Irish churches forcibly closed. The Catholic faith was driven underground. So it's a place in the woods where secretly they would meet for mass. And uh, I respected that place. It meant a lot to me. It still does. William Tracy's father bought one such place in the woods for community worship. They were called Mass Paths. They would deeply influence young William. So it struck me that priest gives meaning to their lives every Sunday. When tragedy comes in a funeral, he's there. So I thought, the best thing I can do for my people would be to provide this and become a priest. The legacy of Irish faith leadership, of course, reached back to St. Patrick in the 4th and 5th century. Just 300 years later, Viking raids threatened to undo that work. But the inaccessibility of islands such as Skellig Muckle, flanked by precipitous cliffs, provided a refuge for monk scholars. Their work, informed by spirituality and devotion, were also inspired works of art. And those works would reinvigorate Christianity at home and abroad. When young William Tracy left home at the age of 13 to begin his studies for the priesthood, he didn't imagine that, in a sense, he would follow in the wake of early Irish explorers such as St. Brendan. Ordained June 18th of 1944, now Father William Tracy accepted an invitation by then Seattle Bishop Gerald Shaughnessy to minister in the United States. I thought, well, I have three uncles in America I think I would like to take the opportunity, so I applied. Mm -hmm. I was given permission to come out here on loan to Seattle for a maximum of 10 years. And I had a small suitcase with my passport and ticket in it. I put it on this train at King's Cross Station in London, turned around to get the other suits, hesitated to see what was going on. 
the next thing I see the train going with my ticket and passport. And I figured, there goes my visit to America. About three hours later, the train came back to that station with a little suitcase on it and my passport and visa. So I was on my way. This time, together with his suitcase, ticket, and passport, Father William Tracy connected with the Queen Mary. Embarked on a troop ship with about 5,000 American soldiers. Ten days in the Atlantic on this troop ship trying to avoid submarines, arrived in New York, um, 25th of February, 1945. But Father Bill's journey from the Emerald Isle had just begun, to the Emerald City, to the Archdiocese of Seattle. Well, everything was new to me. The only tall building in Seattle then was the Smith Tower. He answered that call of faith with distinction as a chaplain at Harborview, and then within parishes, including, of course, Ballard. I didn't know where Ballard was. But a bigger challenge lay ahead. The ministry of young Father William Tracy was about to converge with that of another faith leader, 18 years his senior. Raphael Levine was serving as senior rabbi at Seattle's Temple de Hirsch, now Temple de Hirsch Sinai. As Father Tracy well knew the struggles of practicing Catholicism in occupied Ireland, Rabbi Levine well understood the danger of practicing Judaism, of simply being Jewish. <laughs> Rabbi Levine was born in Vilna, Lithuania in 1901 under the shadow of Tsarist Russia. His family lived in a small home similar to this one, with a thatched roof and dirt floor. The violence directed against Jews led his family to flee to the United States. The Depression forced Rabbi Levine to move his family, accepting assignment as a rabbi in England. where he'd experienced the violence of the German Blitzkrieg of World War II. It was against that background, that experience, that Rabbi Levine sought to improve understanding between faiths in England and then upon his return to the U.S. in Seattle. The Republican candidate for the presidency is running on a platform that you've never had it so good. I think we can do better. In light of anti-Catholicism directed at then presidential candidate John F. Kennedy in 1960, he proposed a television program featuring dialogue between local faith leaders. It would be called Challenge. The program is Challenge. You had been in the United States for a while. You had been working within the Archdiocese of Seattle, and suddenly you were directed to participate in this television program. So one day, Archbishop Conley, without any warning, met me outside his office and said, Rabbi Levine has some idea for a TV program. You're my man. Go talk to him. And I went to talk to him up at the temple. And um, I was, he explained the vision he had for the program. And I, I was completely comfortable with it. But uh, it was, uh, he told about it afterwards. I think it was one of the books. He was uh, disappointed because I looked too young for him to be representing the Catholic Church <laughs> at the time. So anyhow, we got that worked out over the years. We became like father and son. He was 20 years my senior. For the, next half hour, the program uh, Challenge courageously and honestly faced the big questions, the challenges, dividing the faiths and also society. The question before the jury is this. Who crucified Jesus? I, for one, would like to go back to the remark of the first pope when he was speaking to the Jews, some of them who may have been present at the death of Christ, St. Peter, when he said in the third chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers, that the trial of Christ is a continuing thing and no century must disassociate itself from it or no people. That's true, and... Um I would like to uh, suggest in this connection 
that if we can possibly place ourselves in the frame of reference of people who lived during that period 2,000 years ago and realize, first of all, that to those people there was no recognition of what Jesus ultimately became in the Christian tradition. Not even among his disciples. No, not thought. even among his disciples. You did the first program, or you prepared to do the first program. I wouldn't imagine you'd been on television before. How did you feel at that point? Scared, time? scared to death. The program is challenged. Just as Challenge addressed differences between Christians and Jews, it also addressed and built upon points of connection, such as the discussion of the gifts of the prophet Moses. The Mosaic Code is a humanitarian code. Father Tracy and Rabbi Levine's 14-year collaboration would make television history. Their work would win awards. Their influence reached far beyond Seattle. Episodes were filmed in Rome and the Holy Land. We are standing on the steps of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, built in the 4th century over the place called Calvary, where Christ was crucified. In this birthplace of the three Abrahamic faiths, a place often marked by division, by confrontation, the program focused on hope. Jews have always believed in immortality, and they expressed it, of course, in different ways. But they all believed that death on earth is not the end of existence, that it is merely a transition from one form of life to another. Rabbi Daniel Weiner serves as senior rabbi at Temple to Hearst Sinai in Seattle, the successor to Father Tracy's colleague, Raphael Levine. And this is the ark before which Rabbi Levine led holiday services, officiated at weddings and bar, mitzv bar and bat mitzvahs and baby namings. And so this space and this object are, are very, very special to the congregation. Critical link to our history and something that we continue to use and continue to enjoy as an inspiring piece for the next generation of Jews. There is a sense here not simply of history, but of lived faith of perseverance through adversity. One Torah scroll here, rescued from the Holocaust, is on loan to the temple. And nearby, unique to this temple, a chalice presented by Rabbi Levine to Father Tracy during their trip to the Holy Land. And so the idea that way, here, way out here in Seattle, mm -hmm. kind of away from the great East Coast metropolitan you know, cultural centers, that um, you know, two pioneering religious figures, a priest and a rabbi, found a reason to, um, to bridge their differences and to extend the, the fruits and the benefits and the blessings of that, of that connection um, with the entire community well before it was popular, if not even kind of acceptable to do so, is remarkable. While the TV show was wonderful and kind of, um, you know, uh, was able to, to reach millions and millions of people and was a very high profile gesture, you know, I think um, uh, Father Tracy and Rabbi Levine's real legacy was investing in, uh, in the long term, investing in the, the, the um, uh, critical and uh, extended work of what it is to foster understanding between, between peoples. That respect, that sense of gratitude, is echoed by Sheikh Jamal Rahman, a Muslim Sufi leader at Seattle's Interfaith Community Sanctuary. The Sheikh is deeply dedicated both to his faith and to carrying forth the Tracy Levine message of interfaith dialogue. Now, in, uh, right today, we know that to really foster peace in the world, mm -hmm. we simply have to practice what is called coming to know the other on a human level. That seems to be the, the best way to overcome polarization, whether it's religion or politics or culture. In the 60s, in the program called Challenge, Father Tracy and Rabbi Levine and some others 
they had the revolutionary idea that it is critical if we really want genuine uh, peace in our world today, we have to dialogue, we have to connect on a human level by really listening to the other. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it had extraordinary value and was really far ahead of its times. So when I think of Father Tracy, I think of his philosophy as this, like, I think he would say that, Jamal, if your religion comes in the way of your relationship with the other, it will certainly come in the way of your relationship with God. That demonstration came to extend beyond the television studio. When he asked me, after doing a TV program, I was getting in my car at Como, and he said, can you drive to Mount Vernon with me? I said, what's going on in Mount Vernon? You came up to Mount Vernon, and tell us about what you found. Well, I didn't know what the rabbi had in mind. On the way up, he told me what, why I was driving with him. I had no idea. He said, I want to buy this farm, 300 acres, he said, and I want to um, ask the churches to put up a building, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutherans, for their young people, indoctrinate them, but then have them play games together, take meals together, get to know each other, grow up without prejudices. Will you support me? I said, well, Rabbi, that's what I'm trying to do on TV, which of course I go along with it. And this was that farm, a dairy operation 13 miles southeast of Mount Vernon. I had a vision of a cultural center for the Northwest, interfaith, interracial, intercultural. And I said, this is the land that we must have. The transformation from dairy farm to a camp was difficult. Funding was a challenge. But the rabbi's wife, Ruth, had an inspiration. Well, his wife had, con had known the professor of architecture at the university and told him the problem. He agreed to help, if the students would help. So about 15 students agreed. Sleeping in the farmhouse, the students completed the Fisher Lodge in six months. It was named for the family, which then owned Seattle television station KOMO. Governor Dan Evans visited Camp Brotherhood for the dedication. And that word that could best express how we can all work together is brotherhood itself. They provided opportunities for at-risk youth who have never, ever, ever been to camp. And our, we brought in children up here, their dads are in prison. Um, their mothers are struggling. For them to come to a camp like this, to forget everything, to interact with men who are doing things that so positive role models. A lot of these kids are seeking role models. They don't know who to seek, they don't know who to attach to. When they get away from their own comfort zone into a setting like this, their world, their world expands, their world grows. Father Tracy recalls the world of Camp Brotherhood would also grow. Well, we had a number of events here, but probably the most special one was the um, dedication when we had preteens from Israel and Palestine here. I've been with them and watched, uh, congratulated the parents who flew them over here this far, plus organizations that have to sponsor. But um, uh, it was wonderful to hear them talk to each other. A governor from Afghanistan came here with a delegation, and he had a similar experience of seeing a great spirit of unity among people of different races and religions. So he's getting the bus right here to leave. He got off the bus and put his arms around me and said, you and I are all going to be friends. So I figured if you get a Muslim governor's arms around a Catholic priest, there's hope for the world. <laughs>The 1960s, a program called Challenge. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of faith. Nearly 60 years later, during these challenging times, we'll take a new look at our divisions, our connections, in a new program called Challenge 2.0. Special welcome now to our Decades after the original Seattle Challenge the left the air, Father Tracy returned to his Seattle television studio in 2018. He was participating in the launch of Challenge 2.0 and brought the same charm, wit, and wisdom to a new generation. One editorial in a local newspaper said, 
how come it takes a hurricane at Channel 4 mm -hmm. to teach us how to treat each other? Mm -hmm. People volunteering to take people from rooftops and uh, dangers. So to me, if you can capture that spirit of Houston, for the pictures that you just see without words, uh, this is what we're called to do. The program marked a transition in the focus of the Tracy Levine Center following the sale of Camp Brotherhood in 2016. First Father William a Tracy focus on outreach and empowering new voices, examining contemporary issues through the lens of faith, ethics, and compassion, of crossing the bridge to our common humanity. That has to change over time. Recalling how his longtime friend, colleague, and mentor Rabbi Levine used to dot the I's and cross the T's for him, Father Tracy sought to do the same in a conversation on the grounds of the camp where he still lives. What do you mean by religion? Is it just going to church and listening to a sermon and being bored by it, and being turned in on the membership? Or is it that it's opening doors to look at the world around about you and see how can we join up and make it a better place? That's why I say that there's no conflict really if, between true religion and uh, secular. The Pope has said that. I work with an atheist to help people. That's the vision I would say to the religious people and the anti-church. Father, you've had many opportunities during your life of ministry and even people that you've met or read about. Uh, who do you consider to be saints, if you will, people who have exemplified faith in action? Well, I'd say Nelson Mandela, who did 26 years in prison for to see justice and end apartheid in South Africa. And then when he came out to just try to promote peace and understanding, not take vengeance on anybody. Gandhi was the same way. It was, an, and Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln was that type. I would say he was a higher one. And there's a person coming to see him in a few weeks from India, a sister Lucy. And the president of India last March gave her an award for the best social program in India, helping women who have been abused. And she has 42 homes for, ab for abandoned children. Now, she's a very ordinary person. You don't hear about her, but to me, She's up in that category you call a saint. Unneeded changes in the church. I went on TV in 1960 before the Vatican Council when it was a very narrow viewpoint. The Catholic Church, to some degree, shared with other churches. Concentrate on your own membership. How, how can you keep a membership in? How can you keep them? How to be concerned with their personal life and not enough relationship to the community around about them. So the Catholic Church, with the help of Pope Francis, is reaching out now to realize we're not here for the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is here for the community to make it a place of peace and unity, which I believe God intended it to be. Looking back and also looking where we're at right now, do you consider yourself an optimist or a pessimist regarding the future well, and an why? Optimist. I'm an optimist. My, my religion teaches me that, that the, the darkness will not prevail, the light will. And uh, you look back to history, you can see that. And, um, so th that's why I, 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 my religion teaches me that, my own personal life. I don't, you don't be preoccupied with successes and failures. God sees where I don't. And I just pray for all those whose lives have touched mine, that somehow they've been better. Not that I've done it, but that God in his love will complete what I did. The best measures of what a person values, the foundation of their faith, can be found in their home. Father, tell me the significance, what this uh, painting is and what, why that's important. Well, Rembrandt had a very difficult life, a lot of failures in life. At the end of his life, he's trying to figure out, how do I stand in regard to God? Who is God? So he read up this story that Jesus told about the prodigal son. And uh, <clears throat> here's something that most people don't recognize on it. The little gold sword here. Mm -hmm. Well, now, the young man was poor, starving. Why would he keep a gold sword? So that's what the artist is saying. His father gave it to him, and it was his bond with his father. Mm. He didn't want to break with his father completely, so that's why he had confidence enough to go home. Mm. The idea is that he has a new birth. He realized how much his father loves him now, more than if he didn't that somehow many people in life find that by mistakes mm -hmm. to find God, find God's love. The painting summarizes the three simple phrases Father Tracy believes are essential to maintaining any sound relationship. Please, thank you, 
forgive me. On this spring day in 2017, filled with sunshine, good food, and drink, people are here to be warmed, to be filled by the presence of this man. Celebrating connections that went, for some, a very long way back. My parents were the first people he married when he came over here in 1945. He never forgets a name. He doesn't forget a face. Like unconditional love, inclusivity, you know, bringing people together. And it was their love for this man, this priest, and the way he enriched their lives, their faith, that brought them together on this day. And he was, you know, living the faith by action, not just by word. He has a um, understanding of God that is compassionate and loving. And what I see in Father Tracy is a, is a character that very much is in line with the character of Jesus, which is um, a willingness to engage the other person as a human being. The candle on the cake may be extinguished, but the light that is the gift of Father William Tracy, his faith, his work, will continue to shine on many and for years to come. That call to completion is also a call to each of us.